Um, I'm Megan Jackson. I'm just moderating the session today. Uh, I am a program director with the Nebraska Recycling Council. Uh, just the regular housekeeping, I want to say first, the session is being recorded. We will have um, the session available to ticket holders after the conference. Leah, do you want to slip to the, do you have a sponsor slide? Oh, I do. Yep, yep, yep. There you go. Okay. Um, always a very big thank you to our sponsors. Um, you know, I, it's probably if we got to see folks in um, in real life, you, I know you'd see these sponsors, see a name tag at a conference um, and thank them. So maybe just next time you see them at um, in, a, in a chat, send a thank you. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we really appreciate these folks. Um, I, let's see, what else do I want to say? We've got our, uh, Folks have been in the session a couple of times now. At the bottom, um, you can give Leah um, kind of a mind blown, or if you're confused about something, this can be. This is also engaging. So please use your comments when we break, um, or at the end, please feel free to request to grab the mic and uh, and engage. You can join us on stage, ask questions, make a comment. Um, we're going to be sending out surveys at the end of the conference. Please do look out for that and send that back to us so we can just get that feedback. And then tomorrow will be in day three of our virtual conference. Things start kick off again at one o'clock with another one of those award videos. I don't even know who it is, so stay to like <laughs> tune in for that. Those are always really inspiring and exciting. Um, and then that will be our, we've got a session on um, drop-off contamination campaigns with uh, the Recycling Partnership and our own Haley Noli, Recycling Associate, followed by um, End Market, Recycling Market Development with the EPA, including Gail, who's uh, joining us today, this afternoon. So it's great, great lineup again tomorrow. Um, today we've got Leah Meyer. She is a program director with the Nebraska Recycling Council. She joined us just this January um, and kind of hit the ground running. She soon became a um, certified true advisor to facilitate the zero waste planning and implementation. Um, and then we like, then we moved remote in January. So <laughs> her first, uh, first tenure in, <laughs> right in NRC has been a steep, like steep curve. Um, Leah received a master's degree in public administration from the University of Nebraska Omaha, of course, focusing on supporting the operation of local governments. And that is exactly what she has been doing in her role as lead project for the Hub and Spoke program. This year, it's been focused in the Southeast Nebraska. So um, with that, Leah, I'm gonna let you take it away, folks, again, um, Drop your comments, drop questions in the chat box, and um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Megan. And um, yeah, keep your eyes on the chat box because uh, Megan, as moderator, will be um, putting some engagement questions in there for you. Um, this, as Megan pointed out the other day, the benefit of the virtual conference, the virtual format, um, you don't really get to chat with your neighbors um, respectfully in a, in a real life conference. So um, this really makes it a lot more collaborative. Um, and it also gives me immediate feedback if there's something that's confusing. Um, Megan has um, got has the full permission to jump in and say, wait a second, you're you're losing them. What do you mean by that? So um, it's just as this project has been, just like our team is, it's a collaboration. Um, so with that, I'll just jump right into it. Um, first of all, this uh, presentation um, was born out of a full, a full assessment of Southeast Nebraska, a, um, a review of 113, um, well, 160 some mun incorporated municipalities with 113 respondents. Um, so I would be remiss to not thank our clerks and public works directors and utility managers for responding to our questions, um, which we hope to, plan to um, develop into um, action planning and um, 
support for our Southeast communities. Um, this is a project that uh, is, it, is in its third iteration. Um, Megan Jackson has completed the first two in the North Central and Northeast with the support um, of the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy Waste Reduction and Recycling Grant. So thank you so much to NDEE for this. And I must thank our um, early career professional, our recycling associate, Haley Noldy. Um, so many of you that are on the on the conference session right here have probably actually spoken with Haley. Um, and if you have, you'll know it's a treat because she is just, um, she has been a critical asset on this project and it's just a wonderful person to work with. So this report is available online. Megan will be dropping the link in the comments. You'll see um, in behind my photo here, um, some icons that indicate where recycling is available, um, both overall and within with where there's a trailer, where it's not available, where they're not online. We'll see a little bit of that, but because the map is big and the screen is tiny, we won't, um, I don't have a full picture here. So definitely pull up that um, link and we'll get started. Um, let's see here. Okay, so what is Hub and Spoke actually? Um, we say rural recycling infrastructure based out of Hub and Spoke. Um, Hub and Spoke model creates or further develops regional recycling centers that serve as a hub or a collection point and encourages smaller communities or spokes to deliver their collected materials to these hubs. And in this way, the hubs invest in equipment and infrastructure needed um, to create and store high density bales that remanufacturing markets would require um, on a more consistent basis while spokes would invest in collection trailers and strategies um, as well as transportation to that hub. Um, so a lot of times that relationship just kind of come falls together really, comes about um, organically. But as we'll see in the Southeast and in many of our regions, as recycling centers suspend their operation, um, more strategy is needed to go into this. So in this project, we reviewed recycling access and capacity, identifying which locations have robust recycling options and where support was needed. Um, so in this way, we could determine if um, simple infrastructure was needed, like another drop-off container or a drop-off container that is source separated because their single stream was too contaminated, something like that, a little more, a little simpler. Or if um, a broader community or countywide strategy is needed, um, which uh, we're working towards in Cass County is a really good example. That's why I'm so glad Linda's joining us and I would invite her to grab the mic when um, these examples come up. But um, that's, that's what this is, is strategy small and large to get people increased recycling access, build um, commodity material, and um, eventually move out to that, um, you know, golden goal of end market development and reusable products. So um, getting that circular economy together. So here's what it's looked like. Um, there's North Central, Northeast, Southeast. Um, this has been the past three years. Again, it's been 113 communities in the Southeast that responded to our survey. You can see the survey in the appendix, appendices. <laughs> And um, our respondents were municipal clerks and public work managers. Um, we assessed recycling options, collection methods, community motivation, um, level of contamination and recycling, even composting options, compost um, putrescent materials, make up um, food and yard waste, make up about 14% of um, landfill tonnage. So it's a critical part of reducing our landfill um, reliance. Um, motivated stakeholders, community resources, and just the general history of recycling in that community um, because we know that the farther from recycling a community has been, um, it may or may not be more, may be more difficult to get back to recycling. So that's a really important piece for us to understand what their history and what their culture is like in that community. So the second phase of this project, again, uses this information to develop action plans um, based on what that community's capacity or desire is. And that's where that motivation comes in um, based off of resident feedback. Um, and we will continue to support these communities in the years to come. 
So really quick takeaway here, um, just kind of glancing at my, <laughs> at my screen if you see me look off. Um, a little over half of Southeast Nebraska municipalities provide one or more recycling options. We'll go a little more into that. Recycling availability is, was highest within around 30 miles to a recycling center or a materials recovery facility. There are eight recycling centers currently operating in the Southeast, but only four are um, consistently operating. Um, so four of them right now are either permanently or temporarily suspended. We'll talk about seven of them um, because one of them that is uh, temporarily suspended right now, they're just on and offline. They're very, very small, so they won't have an impact on, on what we're talking about. That is in Henderson. Okay, so 43% uh, of um, Southeast communities have no recycling access whatsoever. So even if they have curbside garbage collection, if it's an open hauling system, um, those haulers are not offering curbside recycling. Um, they also do not have a drop-off container. So that's what we mean when we say no recycling available. There is no recycling access within that community. They would have to drive to another community for a drop-off container um, if one exists. 8% um, have only curbside options. And I really want to note that because um, participation in these communities may not be as robust. Um, curbside recycling that is subscription-based would require the resident to opt in, um, which if you were in our contracting session in the last one, you would know um, or have more context that without you know, spreading the cost around, keeping the costs low, there's less, um, just less access overall and less motivation to subscribe to it. 18% have curbside and drop-off containers, while 31% only have a drop-off container. So keep that in mind, too, because that means 49% um, of our Southeast communities have a drop-off container, um, which is why that anti-contamination drop-off um, container session tomorrow, I would really encourage you all to go to that. Great content. Um, and it's with Cassandra Ford, who's literally wrote the manual on um, drop-off container anti-contamination strategies. Um, so, so it's so important. And I had mentioned, um, I paired these two together. Um, I'd mentioned the importance of recycling motivation, and I paired it purposefully with contamination rates. So we asked clerks and public work managers um, what, how, what they determined their community's motivation to recycle is based off of resident feedback. So calling in complaints, um, pu you know, public meetings. So based on their history of their community, what was their, um, how would they determine their motivation to be? Not one of them said that their residents were not motivated to recycle. We had a considerable amount of, yeah, they're somewhat motivated. We've got a, um, we've got a pretty good, good group here that wants to, wants to recycle, but they understand when our, our trailer is suspended for one reason or another. And then a huge swath is very, very motivated. Um, they call when that trailer is full. They give them a hard time. Um, and so, you know, I've, and actually just a very small portion were unsure. Um, and that's good news, but it doesn't really track, right, with the contamination rates that um, were reported by our clerks and public works um, managers. So while a good quarter of them, 25%, were very clean or somewhat clean, um, there is a um, concerning amount that um, stated that 15% stated their containers were somewhat or very contaminated, and 60% were just unsure. And that has implications of its own. So when you're unsure if your drop-off contain container it, or even your curbside is contaminated, it means that you may not have a stronger relationship with your hauler as um, maybe you could or should, because the um, feedback you're getting from your hauler can really you can leverage that in negotiations with the with the cost um, or with, um, you know, you can work together on this price point based on um, a limited amount of contamination. Um, there are different ways as Michael and Vanessa from our contracting um, session would, would be able to elaborate on a little bit further um, 
And then I do want to point out too, um, just to go back a little bit with this recycling motivation statistic. Um, so we had 78% responding motivated or very motivated. The recycling partnership had a national survey that found that 85% of Americans are supportive of recycling with 83% that believe recycling should be made a priority. Um, so that tracks really closely with um, our rural Southeast Nebraska communities. Um, it is, in general, just a very universal concept. Okay, um, and one thing that's asked all the time and such a great statistic, and I'm glad we were able to collect it, or great data rather, um, is the annual average cost of a drop-off container. Um, so I had a lot of, um, you know, village boards, if I would, you know, if I were to speak with a council member, um, they're just saying, you know, they're really skittish about the price um, and generally a lot of skepticism that it could ever be affordable. Well, in fact, we're finding on average the annual cost for a drop-off container was only about um, $2,775. Um, Average cost for pickup is 200. I included the median cost to show the variation um, in price. Um, and note too that on average, a community in Southeast Nebraska, a smaller community a village, they are getting their trailer picked up about once every two weeks. And oftentimes that's on a rotation. It's not necessarily that the um, drop off container is full. It might just be you're on your two week schedule. So, that's a good thing and in some cases can be a not so good thing. Um, as I noted with our very motivated recyclers, they're calling their clerks all the time saying, get it empty because I've got, I've got materials I want to recycle. For curbside garbage and recycling collection, um, it's $16.19 per month with a median cost of $13. And I really want to point this out because while the the drop-off container cost didn't vary so much in the median and average. The um, curbside collection median and average is is a lot more significantly varied. Um, and that is because the farther, in general, the farther away from a recycling center a community is or a materials recovery facility, the more expensive their um their recycling program is going to be. And it makes sense, right? Um, the majority of this cost in a lot of cases is coming from freight, is coming from that um, transportation cost. Okay, and then haulers and access. So I was remiss to have not said, um, we, this data I'm sharing with you um, excludes the city of Lincoln. So um, because Lincoln does not fall into that rural definition that we were targeting, um, so a lot of our villages take their, um, their recyclables or their haulers, they take it to, um, Lincoln or Omaha in First Star. Um, but I bring that up right now because talking about haulers and access, um, to do the Southeast is unique in having a considerable number of waste haulers. And I really wanted to exclude Lincoln in this and, and make that clear. 37 waste management companies were reported operating in the 20 county region that we covered and only 18 of those offered recycling services. And if you would look into that report that Megan dropped, um, you can see where those dead zones are. Um, and it's really because those haulers are operating in those counties where there is, um, you know, it may be two, an hour and a half, an hour, two hours to a recycling um, facility. So recycling centers, um, are, you know, are, are in decline in the Southeast um, and really took a hit in 2019. Good news is that wasn't that long ago. So um, there's things we can do to, to potentially turn it around. Um, but to go back to haulers and access, um, so you'll see looking at that contracted thing, um, stat again, um, and why we keep coming back to that again is because participation is greater under contracted or a municipally operated model. Um, 54 or almost half of the respondents contract with a hauler for curbside pickup, but only 23 communities um, contracted with a hauler with curbside collection in that. Um, so we if they're all, if they already have contracted garbage, you know, we would want to encourage them to include recycling in their next bid process. Okay, and funding resources. So this is another one with the budget. Um, how do we pay for it? So there's a couple different methods. 
these first two, um, so I, I almost would want to put a bar between the first two and the second two, because the first two, I would think of more as a sustaining strategy, while the second two are um, more of a launch point um, or even cost savings. So um, starting with municipal ordinances for hauler permits, um, really, this really did not exist in um, the southeast in the way that it does in the northeast. Um, and what this would do is it would allow um, municipalities um, to leverage um, collecting permitting fees from non-contracted haulers. So those fees can help offset or fund the cost of drop-off container collections, for example. Um, so they don't have to go all the way into um, contracting for curbside recycling pickup. They could just um, have a have an ordinance to collect um, permitting fees from their open subscription, open hauling system. Um, and that would help um, fund things like road maintenance from, you know, having additional trucks on the road or, um, like I say, the drop off container collection. It's a really great method. Cass County does have a um, fee of $100 per vehicle for each hauler on the books with a $20 additional for each um, each additional vehicle. They're not currently enforcing it, but it would be a great way to um, bring in some additional revenue for recycling specific purposes. Outside of the Southeast, um, Blair, Fremont, Hebron, and Grand Island have annual permitting fees to support those administration costs. And so the way they do it, it's between like $230, $250 um, for each company. Um, so you can imagine in something like the city of Lincoln where they have um, so many haulers operating, that could really help offset the drop-off container program in the villages, surrounding villages. Um, solid waste management agencies and other interlocal agreements they're common in other parts of the state, but not as common in the Southeast. Um, in the Southeast, Saline and Seward counties in the um, have an interlocal agreement, have a solid waste management agency, well, they have both, um, called the Saline Seward County Solid Waste Management Agency. So this agency will collect a small fee of one to $2 from the Milford land fee, a per ton tip fee, um, which is then used to reimburse participating communities in Saline and Seward County on their recycling container costs, and in some cases, equipment and cleanup days. So it's a really great relationship, um, really sustaining option. Not every county has a landfill though, right? And we don't necessarily want it to. Um, but solid waste management agencies um, can do a lot more than just, you know, collect a fee from their landfill. You could have a participation fee with the, um, or participation costs, like a flat rate per community. You could have the funding authority to collect like maybe one to $2 per household um, to fund those drop-off container collections. Um, it doesn't have to be a full agency. It could be um, as simple as a interlocal agreement um, with participating communities, but, um, it's a great strategy to kind of um, stop overloading one community as another um, reduces their recycling options. Um, so a lot of different ways to leverage those two strategies there. Following that, partnerships with nonprofits and um, re RCNDs, Resource Conservation and Development Councils. Um, we heard, you know, I'll, I'll shout out, you know, every day, keep, keep Cass County beautiful. Um, as well as um, a lot of our other K and Keep Nebraska Beautiful affiliates, um, we have a lot of communities that really appreciate their um, cleanup days. Our CNDs have um, have supported our communities with cleanup days. This is really more of an accounting cost, so it can save your community by leveraging these um, nonprofits. Um, we had a lot of um, villages, municipalities give um, give a lot of praise to the Four Corners Health Department and the Five Rivers RCD for um, their very consistent household hazardous waste and electronics recycling event cleanup. So shout out to them. Um, and then finally, a lot of state programs. Um, they're a great way to get started. So tire recycling, Clitonia, Steiner, 
really um, utilized tire recycling for their community. The litter reduction grant, of course, adopt a highway even, um, getting like a rebate back on that. Um, the landfill disposal rebate program, which has helped communities with municipal projects and cleanups. So while this wouldn't sustain a recycling project, it's a great way to get started and get your community engaged. Um, and in that report, append, um, Appendix C has the um, has a list of funding resources, at rather grants that you can review and go into. Okay, and then finally, many of our communities went above and beyond with um, support for their uh, went above and beyond in receiving support from their community organizations. So these community organizations have been critical in sustaining their recycling programs. So. Union United is actually our green team of the year award winner. Um, so they have done tremendous work in their community um, and have been working with Keep Cass County Beautiful on sustaining their recycling program, um, but also in restoration um, in their community. So they're fantastic. Check them out. We've got an award video of them, so don't miss it. The Steiner Community Group has also done impressive work in um, applying for state grants. Um, they in doing their own cleanup group um, projects. So they are, you know, this is very grassroots programming. Um, but I've been really excited to hear about how the um, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts of America and uh, FFA has worked. Um, a lot of times these students, these youths will um, be present at the open times of their drop-off container collection. And so what they'll do is they will be present to accept the box of goods of recyclable materials, go through them and educate their residents, their community members on what is recyclable and what is not. Um, it's a great gold project or a great eagle project for girl or boy scouts respectively. Um, and it's very consistent. Um, it can be done year to year. Um, and we just heard such great praise of getting the, the kids involved. Um, Community groups do this too. A lot of times this is um, more aluminum can collection to help fundraise, um, but it's a great way, um, great way to get community involved. We hear less of things like plastic collection, the less valuable um, materials, but glass and um, glass and metals have consistently been a winner even now. Okay, and actually, Let's see, it doesn't look like we've had too many questions, um, but both I, let me see, how what's our time? About 30 minutes into it, so I wondered if, um, Megan, you think this would be an appropriate time to take some grab the mic questions before going into the status of recycling centers? I, I really think so. I think we have, um, I know we have um, quite a few, like, well, I'm not sure, do you have, are there folks in the South, let's first give priority to you, folks in the Southeast. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry, I should have asked, I jumped right now on the in the chat box. Um, if you've got, if we have anybody from the Southeast that is, um, that's in attendance and would like to just share their, uh, just share about their recycling program. If you've got the, you know, the residents that are highly motivated, um, where your funding mechanism is coming from, what kind of community support and the community groups that um, that help support a recycling program. I know we have quite a few, you are in a peer group right now. Um, the attendee, there's quite a few attendees um, in the session. Most of that, many of us come from rural area, like live in rural areas. So um, I, I think that um, that we have, uh, like I said, a lot of opportunity to to connect and to share from be inspired by peer peer support. So, if there's anybody in the southeast that would like to grab the mic, um, Sandy, I will kind of like tee you up um, <laughs> because when we talk about community support, um, the Wayne Green team to me stands out as one of um, one of the movers and shakers. I mean, like this is what this is what happens when you have um, uh, really engaged citizens and uh, engaged citizens really support. Like it's not just about recycling. Like if something comes up in your community and you need. Um, yes, Andy. <laughs> 
Um, do we want to hear from her for just a, if, are you willing to I jump on the mic? Oh, and yeah. kind of, thank you, Haley. The mic is just to the left of the chat box. I believe it's green. Thanks, Sandy. Here we so go. Got it. Oh, it seems to take like one person. It does. Like, thank you for joining Hi. us on stage. Um, yeah, you all, this is Sandy Brown. She is the chair of Wayne's Green Team, Community Green Team. Sandy, will you talk a little bit about, um, well, do you want to talk about yeah, how your citizens are your residents in, um, <laughs> in recycling? your drop off. But um, I think what would be really nice too is the, how the Wayne Green team is connected to your residents and the city. Great. Well, um, yeah, thanks. This has been really helpful to even hear about what's going on in Southeast. But for us in the Northeast, our green team was started fortunately by our city mayor about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now. So having that come from within the city, I think has really made a difference for us. Um, she then appointed community members to participate. And what it's turned into is really driven by community volunteers, but underneath the city. So we have support and uh, they, they manage what little budget we do have. Lots of funds come in through grants, but they do give us some funding. We have a presence on the city's website, and, and that's tremendously helpful. And then we get a regular, you know, uh, column in our city utility newsletter. So we have support staff in that way, and then regular communication and support with our city administrator. We also try to get in front of city council to provide a yearly update because we know it's important to keep the elected officials aware of what's going on and to keep building that support. Um, so then the community volunteers are the ones who try to get the engagement going, who help out, out at our events, electronics recycling or household hazardous waste collections um, and Earth Day events as well. So we've got great support from them, the community from the city. We've partnered with Wayne State College as much as we can and engage with students who are as part of their green team on campus. I think the key is to just maintain that, you know, during this um, pandemic, we've been moving our meetings to virtual, we've had lower attendance, and we're not doing as many any events. So how do we keep people engaged and keep this issue in front? But um, so that's how we've, we've been, I guess, running somewhat of our success and hope to continue it. Yeah, that was a, thank you, Sandy. That was a really good contribution to this section, especially um, of what um, community support can mean in, um, especially in more, in smaller, more rural communities, um, because that is, that was one thing um, I, I would tell our recycling associate constantly throughout the early months when in this project is you can never underestimate the power of a small group of motivated people for good and for bad. Um, but in so many cases we have seen for good, especially, especially in our smaller communities. Um, mm -hmm. It's just really turned the tide um, and just a little bit of feedback, a little bit of pushing um, from some of our, our locations. It's been, really inspiring and really just eye-opening um, what what can be accomplished. So I really appreciated your contribution um, to this talk. Great. Thanks. Thanks, um, Sandy. Um, and Leah, I don't, should we, I, it probably makes sense at some point, I don't know if it's now or later in your presentation, but um, invite if Linda Burns would, Linda, if you'd be willing to grab the mic and jump on um, at some point, do you want to do that now or later? If Linda's oh willing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh, is. Like, no, like, come on, Linda. Yes. Okay, it's come on up. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay. Uh, you have all the same. Yeah, good to see you, Linda. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Let me know what kind of information you're searching for. We're still in um, kind of deliberation with trying to continue our Cass County recycling program. And we're trying to kind of move from the trader program into more of a third party uh, hauling system just because we've had a lot of individuals and city employees who have yeah. 
uh, in recent times, you know, been hauling the trailer and, and after 10, 11 years, you know, some of them are getting tired. They're, you know, tired of the, just that whole routine of hauling those. So we're trying to look for a more sustainable way to do that. And Leah has helped us tremendously with, uh, with advice, but uh, currently we're just still trying to look at, at that change over to system. I think one thing that may come out of it is that we may see more of our community switch to a, uh, a contract possibly with, uh, that is trash and curbside recycling, which, you know, if our if our major goal is to encourage people to do more recycling, that may that may come out to be a good end goal. But I said we're still working on um, I'm going to different city council meetings, trying to answer questions. And so we don't have anything totally resolved yet at this point. We're still working on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and um, Linda, maybe you could clarify, because we, um, we do, in our recommendations, you know, um, because Cass County is, is, is really within it, um, we do talk a little bit about Cass County here coming up um, and about that cooperative model. But Cass County is just so interesting because, you know, from what was it, the 2009 Go Green initiative, so much of it was um, voluntary or well, volunteer-based from the communities. So do, do you mind just um, clarifying that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so in the beginning, they did They did have uh, the county got a grant from the Nebraska Department of Environment at that time and uh, was able to receive seven different uh, trailers for the communities. And then a smaller one was added a couple of years later. And at that time, curbside recycling was not readily available so mm -hmm. a lot of the communities had the trailer for two weeks in one town then they'd empty it and then they'd take it to the next town empty it and and so it, it moved around usually monthly to at least two towns so as some of the communities started to adopt curbside recycling then the trailer was staying in single towns and uh, so you know over the course of time curbside recycling's caught on more and uh, you know just that whole idea of someone volunteer or city maintenance individuals to haul that trailer became more unpopular and uh, so that's why we're trying to look at some other ways to uh, make the recycling more available to everyone and I, I looked at the statistics that you had there Leah as far as um, in Cass County I did some research on uh, as nearly as I could come up with facts and figures and we believe we have about 37 percent or nearly about 10,000 people in the rural communities here in the county that do not have easy access to recycling. So that was mm -hmm. kind of the impetus of looking to the commissioners to try to come up with, you know, can we develop a plan that would maybe address that issue and make recycling more available to everyone. And I don't know if we're going to accomplish that, but, you know, if, uh, end goal wise, we may at least have more recycling in the whole county. Right, right. Shoot for the, how's the phrase, shoot for the moon and among the stars. Um, we'll yeah. get somewhere for sure. Um, okay, yes, thank you, Linda. Um, and I I may touch more on that and, and ask you to contribute in the comments um, as we as we continue on. Because um, next up, we'll be talking about the status of our recycling centers and what the region actually looks like. Um, so thank you again, Linda. This was, it was wonderful to hear from you. You're welcome. I'm enjoying Thanks. the conference. Thanks for all your hard work on it. Oh, gosh, we appreciate hearing that. It's been a great time. Um, and here I'm going to de-link you. There we go. There we go. Cool. Thank you again, Linda. Um, OK, and so that is a really great transition into our um, boop into the status of our recycling centers. We're gonna talk about what is currently operating. Um, so, and why we bring all this up is because these are potential spoke areas, both the currently operating and currently suspended, um, whether that's a temporary suspension or a more long-term, um, more of a long-term issue. And I do need to bring up that this, what you're seeing was accurate as of around May 2020. If you were in our last session, um, as Michael has pointed out, things have been changing in the last nine months, um, let alone several years. So, um, 
some of this may not be currently accurate. Some may be back online and some may be um, back offline. And where I know that to be the case, I'll make that correction here. Um, but to the best of our, our knowledge, um, currently, we're going to start with the city of Lincoln, um, which has two recycling centers, Green Quest and Recycling Enterprises. This is a hub not just for the villages of Lancaster, but for um, so many of our communities, like most most generally farther west, um, because east of Lincoln, they tend to go to, towards First Star, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, communities as far south as Thayer and Pawnee City are taking their materials up to Lincoln, which is more than an hour away. So, um, and their costs are greater for it, um, but they don't necessarily have um, an other option if they want to continue to recycle. The city of Seward does have an operating recycling center and it's, re it's very well run. Um, but unfortunately, it's not open to accepting um, drop-off containers from surrounding municipalities. They are they will accept it from residents, um, but they don't have the capacity to take on full village-sized loads every two weeks like um, what we would want to see out of a hub community. Um, this is run by um, you know a one public works manager and is actually volunteer operated. So um, the the university volleyball team actually helps out there a lot. Um, a retirement home comes and helps sort. Um, so you can imagine they did go down um, temporarily during COVID, but pop back up as quickly as they possibly could. And they do a phenomenal job there. Um, if Bob Myers is on, we'd love to hear from him, but um, he's been a tremendous asset for the community. And then the city of Beatrice has a recycling center and this operates as a true hub for, um, for Gage County. Um, it it is owned by the city of Beatrice and leased to sanitary garbage, which is a, um, it's an arrangement that's so been in place for many, many years. The, um, their manager, Deb Bell, actually couldn't give me a, um, a number on how many years that relationship has been in place, but it's very, um, well entrenched. Um, the center can accept drop-off containers from surrounding villages serviced by um, drop-off containers and curbside collections serviced by sanitary garbage, other third haulers, and any residential drop-offs. Um, the facility has a baler, a forklift, and, um, and a sort line. It's staffed by 33 employees, 10 of which are um, in the um, recycling area and they will sort it and put it into bins to bail and move out. Their greatest challenge is the volatility of the markets. You'll hear that again and again, um, as well as standard contamination, um, but specifically products of mixed materials. So like looking around in my own office, um, think of a um, hand sanitizer uh, bottle. So the vessel is probably plastic number two. Um, you know, high quality plastic, but the pump has a metal spring in it. Um, and that is a challenge for their, um, their facility to operate. But, you know, they have manual sorters. Um, and depending on the load, they can unscrew it, but that's not ideal. And that's a waste of their time um, and a waste of their resources driving up costs. So contamination really does impact um, the whole circular model. Recycling centers that are temporarily suspended, we'll talk about this This now. Um, the York Recycling Center has been closed since 2019. It is also, just like Beatrice, it's owned by the city, um, and it's actually part of their landfill operation. It was leased and operated by the nonprofit Mosaic. It cost $100,000 to $150,000 per year to operate. They were accepting three to four drop-off containers per day. Now, if you can see it, those little red dots surrounding York is the vacuum that um, was created when the York Recycling Center closed down, unfortunately. They were actually taking their materials to Green Quest in Lincoln for processing. Um, the center is still operational. It still has a baler and a forklift that um, I'm told is still is still operating. And the city administrator is open to leasing that center to a, um, to a third party. Um, some of the surrounding villages have indicated that they would be open to exploring a cost sharing model. Um, so that's certainly a goal for um, this project moving forward is to start facilitating those conversations. 
Um, the greatest challenge indicated by um, the city administrator was that it was just not able to absorb the cost of fluctuating materials. Um, at the time of their closure, I believe cardboard was around um, $20 or even $10 um, a ton, if it ever got that low. Um, but regardless, uh, it just was far too expensive to um, to operate. Um, so strategizing to absorb those costs is a critical component as well. Um, the city of David City, they suspended their operations in early 2020. This I would not say is a permanent closure at this point. They're still looking at ways to go um, back online um, following a new agreement with their processing center for Star in Omaha. Um, they are a hub to many in Butler County. Um, and they have a storage unit that they will store their materials in um, until they're what they've collected um, becomes they can until they can break even on that and have it be financially viable. So um, Clayton Keller, their city administrator, states that the primary reason that um, is that they just can't move this material that wouldn't negatively impact the city's finances. So working with the city too to you know strategize on preparing for those costs, that cost volatility that we, if you were in the previous session, you heard from Michael, that's a, that's a critical part of this strategy as well. But um, they take cardboard plastics, number one and two. Um, so they have a, a pretty simple operation, but still very important. Um, and I do want to point out that they are just south of Schuyler. So um, we're looking to see if there are some possible collaborations with that as well. Okay, and I uh, recently learned that the City of Falls City's Recycling Center, um, this looks like a more permanent closure. So um, they this recycling center has been really plagued with issues um, throughout this year and, and part of last, um, as many locations have. This is privately owned and operated. Um, and this private hauler that owns it Hamilton Recycling and Disposal um, collects curbside from their residents and accepts curbs or accepts materials from surrounding just residents driving up. Um, but they don't have any relationships with surround. They didn't have any sur any relationships with surrounding villages to um, collect their drop off containers. Um, and especially in this in Richardson County, um, their haulers do not offer recycling services and their municipalities, their public works managers were not moving it as you might see in Cass County, for example. So um, it costs, this is a small operation, it costs 42 to 48,000 per year to run. Um, they had two full-time employees and one part-time employees. Um, they had a forklift and a baler and a mechanical sort line. So. We are um, talking with their um, with their green team. Fall City does have a green team um, who are very motivated to get started um, and looking at, you know, what's the potential of purchasing this um, from from this private hauler. Um, they have an open subscription system, open hauling system in Fall City. So there's some um, other political aspects at play. And I'm sorry, um, I do want to indicate that the largest challenges in this region is actually getting economies of scale, including standard contamination. But this is very unique that they simply could not get enough material to move to their end markets um, in a way that was cost effective and didn't, they weren't storing it for so long that the material degraded. So they needed more material um, to ship out and just weren't able to get it. Yes. That's actually, thank you. I think that's a really good point because that is um, such the crux of um, of hub and spoke, right? And why we why we look at hub and spoke as the model in our rural areas um, is to consolidate material, um, right? So with Falls City, is that I see um, that part of is it Beatrice taking material that so that actually we've got, we have maybe two communities that are too close or is it more that Fall City did not have enough participating spoke like surrounding the po the population wasn't dense enough for do you want to talk a little bit more yeah, about that yeah Mm -hmm. So what's really interesting is that Pawnee City, for example, 
Recycling Enterprises is taking their drop-off container and they're hauling it up to Lincoln. They're not taking it to Beatrice. Um, so because Beatrice is limiting, they're trying to limit a little bit more to just Gage County and keep it more manageable in that way. Um, Fall City was actually taking material from um, Kansas and Missouri. So people were driving in from um, from out of state to get this. Um, they just didn't have the, from from the conversations I've been having, they just didn't have the um, municipal or the county level coordination um, to just get get some of these to the table. Um, and it really might depend on the motivation of their city leadership or even their residents. Um, but from what we're hearing, um, for example, Auburn, extremely motivated to recycle. Um, Steiner is, um, like I mentioned in my community, um, they are also extremely motivated to recycle. So, you know, as I indicated in our survey, how would they, how would clerks and, and municipal officials assess residential motivation to recycle? There was none that said that the residents were not motivated to recycle. And so, um, I think there's a lot of potential here. The, the issues were, um, were a lot of, of just getting drop off containers and getting enough economy of scale, um, to move to their end markets, which they had good relationships with end markets. So we'll, we'll continue to, to work that and see what the issue is. Um, okay. Good. Thanks, Leah. Yeah. Good okay, question. And then, Jane, we uh, can probably, we'll wait for the Q and A and maybe touch on some of these questions that are coming yeah. up. Yeah. I'll let you go. And I appreciate yeah, I appreciate everyone. I know we're going a little bit over, um, but we are close to finishing here. We are um, just going to, if I can find where I'm at, um, recommendations. So our last three um, recommendations we would make is um, building cooperation between municipalities. So we were just talking about this, right? Um, interlocal agreements for contracted drop off so cost sharing. So Linda was just, um, when we had her on, um, what we are, are talking about with Cass County um, and what the issues are is twofold issues. We saw in Fall City um, is getting um, cost sharing so that it's equitable amongst um, amongst these communities um, and and more cost effective. Um, so to have you know send out an invitation for bids, um, have a um, an, a standard or expected amount of, you know, per cost pickup, um, as opposed to what we're seeing in Cass County, for example, where a um, community might get overloaded or they might decide to to end their recycling program. And then all of those community members drive, you know, the 15 miles or so to the next town over, overloads their drop-off container. Um, now, instead of they're, what they budgeted for was every two weeks, they're having to unload it every week um, or contending with a lot of illegal dumping as people surround their trailers, their drop-off containers. So um, interlocal agreements to make um, cost sharing equitable um, and consistent, um, as well as having those consistent drop-off schedules that might be for the best for those communities. Um, or developing a solid waste management agency for setting policies, you would have a, um, a council of people that would develop grants. This would be outside of um, your commissioners, for example, or your um, your county board, you know, which is just outside of their scope and they're just too busy to take on things like grant requests for recycling um, or resource management. Um, and they can also just develop other financing strategies that might be more appropriate to their community. Um, we don't want to be too prescriptive here. Um, every county, every community is different. And they're going to have their different resources. Um, building quality and quantity. Again, we just talked about this. So um, more contamination can mean more expense. Um, certainly those expenses are um are increasing at the recycling center and those are going to be passed on to the hauler and eventually to the um, community itself. So anti-contamination strategies are critically important in sustaining our recycling centers. If they're having to spend too much time and money um, to pick through actual garbage, um, they may not be able to stay in business um, for too long. Um, and then increasing participation through contracting. Again, contracting then becomes an opt or recycling becomes um, and actually choosing not to do it 
even though they're paying for it. So most people will start recycling um, because now they're paying, they're actually paying for it. They're obligated to pay for it. And so their participation rate goes up um, through that contracted model. But, you know, while that sounds almost punitive, costs go down in a contracted model. So it can be often, so it can be a really attractive model for um, communities, a strategy for communities overall. Contracting also has the benefit of um, improving transparency and um, communication. So a village clerk may not be able to send out or develop um, flyers or, you know, he or she may not be able to do that on their own. But there, if this is an agreed upon relationship with their hauler that could provide a... Um, you know, a flyer, just a list of what acceptable material is, um, have that sent out on a quarterly basis, biannual basis. These are great strategies for consistently reminding and providing feedback to your community. Um, and improving transparency. I can't tell you how many times we have talked with um, community members that have said, yeah, I want to recycle, but I think they're just landfilling it. We had a community in Clitonia where their village board actually followed the garbage, the recycling truck. Um, and the garbage truck, they were apparently um, doing the collection at the same time. Thankfully, they split off one to Beatrice, one to one to the landfill or one to Lincoln, one to the landfill. And um, but this individual was so suspicious of it. He actually followed this truck to make sure that they are going to be recycling. Um, transparency is a critical issue in our industry right now. People are rightfully concerned that their material is not being recycled. So that is part of your um, contracted, your hauler relationship. How are you communicating to your residents that this is a critical asset? What they are doing is actually working um, and residents want that feedback. Okay. And then finally, um, kind of the third iter iteration of this, a little more on the um, hauler and MRF side, um, but as quality and quantity of materials increase, recycling centers should habitually evaluate their relationships with their end markets or their MRF, including um, formal or informal agreements. Um, a formal agreement could be as simple as a predetermined cost per ton delivered. Um, so we saw this in Cass County. Um, it sounds like First Star is charging um, Cass County drop-off container a flat $65, um, makes it really easy on everyone. Um, so that could be a, for, uh, a, a formal arrangement, um, may not be the best for, for a community. Um, they might, they should assess, um, continually if that is still a relationship that works out. But, um, it is a, it is a relation, example of a relationship I want to point out. Um, it could be as advanced as, um, revenue sharing, material audits, education and outreach support that we just talked about, and clear expectations on contamination or contingencies. So we heard again that in the last contracting session. So in this way, MRFs and recycling centers are partners in managing costs, which could lead to a more sustainable program. So I know we ran well over. Thank you for our attendees. I haven't really seen any drops in our attendance. So thank you for, for staying on with us. And I want to continue to be here and be present for questions. So, um, yeah, I think yeah, you were, let me know what's going on. We were, I think we were scheduled till 345. Oh, were we? Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I see yeah. that we're at an hour <laughs> that we've been running. So hooray, then we're not over. <laughs> You're not over. You're not over. I hope you, that didn't feel like you were you were being pressured. Well, I hope you um, So yeah, no, folks, um, we still have, definitely have um, have time. So if there, if, if um, you'd like to come on the stage and share anything, ask questions. Um, Jean, I want to just expand to that point. Um, many of our... And actually, Leah can tell, talk about the Southeast. Um, it has in the Northeast and North Central, um, and many drop-off programs do, uh, instead of collecting all one through seven plastics or the variety of plastics, um, focusing on just the materials that actually have strong, more, um, less volatile uh, markets, including plastics one and two that are more durable as well. And, um, Part of the kind of business, like the strategy of those drop-off programs will also to separate those materials um, so that we cut down. It's like looking at how to cut down on the processing cost and the cost that it's going to cut for um, a recycling center to sort, um, sort that material. So looking at trying to operate more efficiently as well. 
Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's a great, I really like that suggestion, Jean, and I hear you. Um, but as, you know, as we saw from the operating recycling centers, um, you really only have two in the Southeast, well, three with First Star um, in Omaha that, you know, are being funneled towards. And so all of those processing centers are accepting, you know, your plastics one through three or one through seven and et cetera, you know, your general regular lineup. Um, Beatrice as well um, has put no uh, limitations that, um, so it was really only David City that had, um, David City up north that had more of a limited, um, limited roster of what they would accept. Um, we did have, there were a couple communities that only accepted cans. Um, and those were the ones where like Kiwanis and Region 5 where they were operating because they weren't doing it with a hauler. They were just actually collecting cans and scrap metal and things like that um, to fund their own program. So I wouldn't really count that in here. Um, yeah, I agree. I think for some uh, location like if getting York or um, Fall City going again, that would be something um, that if they contract with a third party, um, there wasn't really, since these are all like, um, these weren't um, industry recyclers, these were all municipal collections. Um, you know, people are, the, the breakdown of what is being recycled really didn't vary um, from our understanding. So, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great, great consideration for sure. I didn't see too much more in the, like, any questions that really, that did come out. Kayla did ask about engaging with volunteers. Sandy, thanks for picking up the mic on that one, the, uh, the answer on that one. Um, I would say, I, you know what, I'd love to hear, Leah, your experience in the Southeast, um, that what I have identified as in the, in some of the hub and, sp in hub and spoke work in the, an assessment in the Northeast and North Central um, regions we've covered is, so there's there's a couple of challenges for, um, it's a funding. We need to identify the funding mechanisms that, uh, so residents are more fairly and everybody in that region is, is able to contribute to the success, the long-term financial and the economic success of a, of a recycling center. And then, um, you know, some of these recycling centers that do, Skylar is one of them that, uh, that I believe uh, relies somewhat um, Beth on, is. Yeah, Beth might be trying to get on, I'm not sure, um, <laughs> might, might be relying on, on volunteers. So when you've got, when you actually, um, programs that need, that lean heavily on volunteers are, um, kind of put themselves at risk of, of being more vulnerable to, well, a pandemic, for example. I mean, that, that like the liability yeah, concerns. Um, also the volunteer turnover as well. So um, it's, it's not when we talk about um, operating a recycling center, a recycling program on a, on a that other level is, um, is different than, you know, uh, is a challenge, can be a challenge to sustaining a program for long term. Mm -hmm. In the report, so you heard me talk about um, the city of Seward and how they, um, a lot of their materials are sorted by volunteers um, and groups of volunteers. Um, so I'd mentioned um, the university had student groups, which is fantastic. Um, the, they also had a uh, a group of elders, um, I think they, they came from a retirement home, but church groups as well um, was another one that Bob had mentioned. So um, really great allies in that program. I think they were able to pay some of the retirees um, a little bit, which also um, I wasn't able to go into depth here in terms of community support, but that was a really unique strategy that I think it was Deschler um, took on. Uh, they... <laughs> they paid a retiree, um, I believe it was about $600 a year stipend, so not a whole lot, but she would, um, their recycling center, their, their drop-off container rather, just fenced off, 
was open a couple of hours on the weekend. And so she would sit out there, monitor the trailer. And um, as people were coming in, like I mentioned with the scouts, she would go through them. And so when we ask, um, <laughs> when we asked our municipalities, you know, how clean is your, is your drop-off con container collection? I really trusted those ones. They, they yeah. actually had eyes on. They had people picking through. Um, and yes, highly motivated communities. So, um, um, Let's see. I wanted to, you had some really, with the theme of this, um, of our conference being um, building resiliency in our, in our recycling systems, just wondering if folks want to drop in the chat box are there two things like how how are how is your community um, being building a more resilient system, recycling system, and then if there were any good takeaways from this session and from uh, from the report findings from the data that um, that we had in the southeast, I personally I think that um, that what we are. One of the pieces that I feel like we've drove home a little bit in this conference, um, Leah, with, with your, your report findings right now and um, the, the contracting session we had uh, complemented by that contracting session is contracted hauling is really where we can get um, our, our cost efficiencies and the, the best solutions out there. And there are solutions that are available for how to negotiate, how to how to move through that process from an open hauling system, move through an open hauling system to contracted that can serve your haulers as well. Um, yeah. Oh, so very people much so. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd also like to address Haley Nolde, our um, recycling associate. She just dropped in the chat box. Um, I was remiss to have not mentioned the um, anti-contamination, the uh, education component of this project. Um, so uh, we, in our survey, we requested, um, of course, how contaminated is your drop-off container? And using that information, we identified communities that might be a good fit for anti-contamination strategies, um, which is what Haley has taken on. So two communities in the Southeast are um, receiving <clears throat> receiving additional attention um, and follow-up strategy on how they, um, how contaminated their, their drop-off containers actually are. We are performing a waste, an audit on their, um, on their drop-off container. Um, you know, pulling out, seeing what the contaminate contaminants are. Um, and so in doing this, we are asking for community volunteers. Um, Haley has been working with their village clerk, um, their clerks, their, their council scribes, and um, those individuals are huge assets in um, Haley, drop in the chat box or, or come on, but I know that she's, they are recruiting high school students um, for their, you know, final volunteer projects. Um, that has been a big one. But they also know who their recycling champions are. Um, and that's been really fun to see. Um, they, they'll talk about Donna, who's always recycling and always trying to get on us. So those exist in all of our communities. Um, and it, the clerks know them. So, Haley, do you want to elaborate? Yeah, and I think they were saying, um, my point was, your clerks, your city admin, they know their community better than you do if you're coming into the community. So asking them first, we, um, the two communities we're working with, we just went ahead and asked the clerks to identify and recruit those um, volunteers just because if it's coming from them even, it's a little more trustworthy than an outside NRC coming in and asking them for help. Um, so just being transparent and working with the community members themselves. Um, yeah, thank you for that point. This is also, I, I'm thinking about Sandy, you know, any of you folks that are, uh, that are joining us um, and have drop-off recycling programs, uh, I know there's a lot of great takeaways from this session. I will encourage you tomorrow, day three, 
Um, things again start at one o'clock with uh, with the kind of the intro for the day and another award presentation video. But this battling contamination in your drop off containers, the the session Haley is monitor, moder, moderating, excuse me, um, with the recycling partnership. Um, it's going to be phenomenal. I Haley, you're going to be talking about the doing a waste, doing an, an actual waste audit at the recycling trailers, correct? Um, we touched you. Using it as a strategy to um, for contamination education, preventing that. Yep. So you folks that have drop-off programs, um, that session tomorrow, again, that starts at 1.10 p.m. tomorrow, is going to be a really great one to go th to go through. Um, and then that's what the la then we start uh, right after the contamination um, battling contamination workshop is. Um, uh, with the EPA strengthening the system with recycling market development, that'll start at 2 p.m. So um, I don't know, Leah, if you'd like to ha close us out in statements or cl have any closing statements for us, but thank you folks for joining. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Megan, for moderating and for everybody that grabbed the mic on stage. And I will just reiterate what um, Megan was saying, where we talk about building quantity and quality with your anti-contamination strategies that's happening tomorrow and the end goal of that right is to build up that enough quantity demonstrating that we have the materials for end market development bringing those jobs those local jobs here which again would reduce uh -huh. the cost of recycling so look forward to tomorrow because everything we've talked about today just feeds right into um, what we're talking about for the rest of the week Perfectly so we true. really appreciate <laughs> we really appreciate all of you. Um, we're so excited to see you tomorrow, and thank you for a great second day of the conference. We'll see you soon. Bye, all. Bye, all. Thank you.